Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see smiling faces here. And I hope that you have come with your cup right side up and already overflowing. We're going to sing. And let's start our service this evening with His Name is Wonderful, His Name is Wonderful. We know that one. Would you care to join me in standing? And let's lift it from our heart. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King. singing and I appreciate that. You may be seated. Let's sing number 618 if you would like your music and your hymnal still sweeter every day. Let's lift again our hearts. To Jesus every day I find my heart is closer drawn. He's fairer than the glory of the golden purple dawn. He's all my pleasures in his fairest dream and more. Each day he grows still sweeter than he was the day before. The hand cannot be fancy. This side, the golden shore. Oh, there. Still sweeter than he ever was before. His glory broke a 
upon me when I saw him from afar. He's fairer than the lily, brighter than the morning star. He fills and satisfies my longing spirit more and more. Each day he grows still sweeter than he was the day before. The hand cannot be fancied. This side the golden shore. Oh, there he'll be still sweeter than he ever was before. My heart is sometimes heavy, but he comes with sweet relief. He folds me in his bosom when I drink blighted grief. I love the Christ with all my burdens in his body more. Each day he grows still sweeter than he was the day before. The half cannot be fancy. Beside the golden shore. Oh, there he'll be still sweeter. get out and you want to just share a word real quick after a song like that I thought there might be a possibility well let's continue our singing let's turn to number 422 if you're in your hymnals and we'll put it on the screen praise the Lord my soul is filled with glory Jesus found me when a heart I wander brought me pardon from the throne above, gave me peace that passeth understanding, joy unspeakable and full of love. Praise the Lord, filled with glory. Praise the Lord, I love to tell the story. That sacrifice me freely, and I'm shouting glory till I get home. Through his word, he taught me full salvation, how his blood could cleanse and sanctify. Then by faith I plunged into the fountain. Now I'm looking for that home. Praise the Lord, my soul is filled with glory. Praise the Lord, I love to tell the story of His grace that sanctifies me wholly, and I'm shouting glory till I get home. Trials many will be set my pathway. I shall surely be, but my Savior promised grace to help me till I lay my trophies at His feet. Praise the Lord, my soul is filled with glory. Praise the Lord, I love to tell the story of His grace that keeps and gives me victory. And I'm shouting glory till I get home. Amen. Still sweeter every day. Praise the Lord. My soul is filled with glory. Let's sing. He rolled the sea away. You'll find those words on 649 if you like those. And let's sing this together. Away before. 
sea of sin so great I fear to pray. My heart's desire the Savior read and rolled the sea away. Then forward still tis Jehovah's will, though the billows dash and spray. With a conquering tread we will push on. Like stormy waves were dashing o'er my way. Again the Lord in mercy came and rolled the sea away. Then forward still tis Jehovah's will, though the billows dash and spray. With the conquering tread. Pray with me. Father, it's indeed a good thing to be together tonight with your people. We just uh, count it such a privilege. And uh, we know that in some parts of the world, this would not be a safe place or a safe thing to do. And we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world tonight that are in danger uh, just by meeting together in your name. I pay, pray specifically tonight for Paul and uh, Beatrice Matombo in Zambia. I don't know much about them, but you know, and you know their struggles, you know their challenges, and uh, I know there's information available to us about them, and I pray that we would take it upon our own hearts tonight to learn more about them and to lift them up regularly. To you. I also think about uh, Ed and Debbie Becker tonight and the great losses that uh, Ed has suffered this week and uh, I pray your special strength upon Ed and Debbie. Uh, it's a loss that I cannot understand personally I, but some here can understand it at least have experienced it, and I pray your special blessing on Ed tonight. And also for Brother Tim, and where he is, uh, holding a special meeting, and uh, I suspect he's uh, ministering even as we're standing here tonight, and I, I pray that uh, you would uh, bless him especially, and uh, just as he uh, expresses the things that you put in his heart. Thank you for Larry uh, and his musicianship this evening. I know he blesses the hearts of many here, and for Martha. Um, bless Carol tonight as she ministers to us in song, and 
especially bless Pastor Sweezy as he uh, opens your word to us. We love you tonight. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Sister Carol Lowry is going to come and share with us some special music, and you pray for her as she comes and open up your heart to the Holy Spirit and how he wants to minister to us. God bless you. Each step I take, my Savior goes before me, and with his loving hand, he leads the way. And with each step, I whisper, I adore thee, oh, what joy. I take
Would you turn your Bibles with me to uh, 1 John chapter 3? And I'll begin reading at the seventh verse. Whenever you're reading 1 John and you read the phrase, Dear children, you need to understand that he's, he's not being offensive and talking to himself as some kind of a superior, although he is that. He's an apostle, and at this time he wrote this, an aged apostle who has lived a long time and done quite a bit and seen a few things. But he's, he uses that as a general phrase to address the church. And he is talking to him. And uh, he's talking to the church that way. And so he doesn't mean to insult anybody, just the opposite. It, it's, an, it's a term of endearment. endearment and it means that, that he really loves us and cares about us. My, my children. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him and he cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Um, I want you to notice that in the ninth verse, there's a phrase that's repeated over again. No one who is born of God, he says, will continue to sin. Nobody who is born of God. And then he cannot because he has been born of God. When we were talking this morning about being born of God, we talked about what he's discussing there as being born again. And it's different than justification. Justification, uh, our sins are forgiven, our guilt is removed, and we are, we are made able to have a relationship with God. But being born again is new birth, and we are born into the family of God. And it's a spiritual thing that takes place. And we need to realize that it becomes life in the Spirit. And this life in the Spirit, as we discussed this morning, has a lot of parts to it. There's a lot of things going on about it. But one of the things we need to know is that as this life in the Spirit is going on, we're growing and we're learning things as we walk with God. Every new spiritual truth that comes to us comes to us by faith, and when we receive some new spiritual truth from God, it causes a reaction, and we begin to do something in return in God's direction. What, what are we doing? Well, we pray. Uh, in God's reaction, we, we praise Him. Hey, thanks for showing me that. Wow, that's great. Isn't it wonderful what God is doing? And so I asked if we could just change the songs tonight, and they would include the song, that of, of praise because I love that song. I was thinking about it today and I thought, we ought to sing that tonight. Praise the Lord. Uh, my soul is filled with glory. And then it also needs to bring thanksgiving back to God. The spirit within us wants to yield up thanksgiving to God and to praise Him and also love. We love Him because He first loved us, it says in the scriptures. But the truth is, it's a relationship, a live, living relationship that's going on. Now, um, we need to also understand that when we are born of the spirit, we began to develop within our own lives a certain amount of discernment. Now, I'm not talking about the spiritual gift of discernment that's discussed in uh, 1 Corinthians, but I am saying that, that a, a measure of discernment begins to develop in our lives, and that discernment is the very thing that Adam and Eve were looking for when they disobeyed God in the garden. It's to be able to discern the difference between uh, good and evil. And we who are born into God's family have a certain amount of discernment in us and we begin to get a sense about things, about whether this is good or bad. And when we're young Christians, and we haven't been Christians very long, sometimes uh, that warns us and keeps us from getting into trouble. Uh, let me say this about uh, discerning good and evil. Uh, sometimes it's, it's like an alarm bell that goes off in your soul. There's something wrong here. You don't quite know what it is, but you sort of feel it more than you know it. And so as a result, your guard comes up. 
automatically. And, and it should come up spiritually. And you back up a step or two and, and try to examine what it is you're dealing with and, and uh, understand that it, is this something good or is this something bad? Now, in the spirit world, sometimes the, the good things can be very good. And sometimes the evil things can be unbelievably wicked. And we're ignorant of those kind of things. I remember I was walking down the street in Schaffenburg, Germany one time, and I, I came to the army chapel. It was the post chapel, the main chapel for, our, for all the different concerns. That's what they called the military post around, around that part of Germany. It was the main one, and I came by, and a, and a guy walked up to me on the sidewalk. We were just passing the chapel, and he walked walked up to me on the sidewalk and he said uh, hello and I, I said hello back to him and then he started talking and when he started talking I started feeling something's wrong here and I had my guard up and the longer he talked the, the more concerned I began to the alarm bells were going off I couldn't figure out what what's going on sometimes people are wicked and uh, he, he kept talking and he, so he asked me directly, where are you going? Well, what am I going to do? I'm a Christian. I can't lie to the guy. I really didn't want him to go with me. I didn't want him to know where I was going. But, I, okay, I'll, I'll tell him. So I told him, well, um, I'm in charge of a coffee house ministry over here on this concern, and, and I'm going over there to open up, and, and uh, the fellows come in, and, and we talk to them about the Lord and about the Scripture and things like that. Oh, good, I'm a Christian too, and I, I want to come with you. All right. He came with me. We went in and opened up. Coffee was running. Everything was working fine. People began to come in. Some of the other guys who worked with me in the ministry showed up. And uh, I got them aside and I said, look, I've got a bad feeling about this guy. Keep your eye on him. And we had, I don't know at that time, about nine brand new Christians, people who had recently been saved in that coffee house through our ministry. And I watched him going around the room and he went to each one of those nine people and avoided other people. Just like as if somehow they had a target on their back. And he was talking to them. And then after a while, he got them organized together over in a corner and was talking to them. And I thought, this isn't good. What's, what's going on over there? And so I, I called out to one of my uh, prayer warrior buddies and I said, let's go over and see what's going on. And we went over and I no more than got near the circle where we were, and all of a sudden, uh, one of those young guys who had just been a Christian like about a week and a half, got up in my face and said, what do you mean by coming over here? Well, <laughs> it's the coffee house that I'm running. I can walk anywhere I want. What are you talking about? Why are you talking to me that way? We don't, we don't want you over here. We're talking with him. What's, uh, please tell me what's going on. In a very short period of time, he had somehow twisted that group around into thinking that there was something evil going on in the coffee house, and he was going to lead them to straighten it all out. And they bought it. And I mean, we really had a time with those guys. And finally, one of the fellows who was there with me said, well, <clears throat> it looks like we have a real division here. What has new has been added that a division has been come? I think it's you coming in the doors, the only new thing that's happening around here. But here's what we'll do. We'll pray, and, and we'll ask God, and God will show us what's going on. And so we just got down on our knees and began praying. And finally, slowly, those nine fellows that had gotten saved got shamed, and they got down on their knees too. They didn't immediately, but they finally got down on their knees too. And, and the other fellow, the fellow that came with me, he didn't. He never did. And he, and he wasn't praying. And uh, as we were praying, the Lord came, and there was a real blessing, and people began to praise the Lord and give glory to God. And when we finished praying and stood back up, he was gone. He had left the building. What are you trying to say, Pastor? I'm trying to say that sometimes wickedness can reside in a person. And they can cause an awful lot of trouble in a, in a really short period of time, especially when they're motivated by the devil. And uh, being harmless, as we often are as Christians, we don't recognize 
those kind of dangerous and see those things that are going on. Remember that our weapons are not the weapons of this world. We couldn't just grab him by the scruff of the neck and the, and the seat of his pants and toss him down the stairs and tell him to get out of the building. It, it wasn't like that, but we sure prayed him out of the building. I, I never saw anything like that. He, he, one of the guys said he, he came down the stairs like he was in a hurry to get somewhere. Some fellow passed him on the stair. Never saw him again. And I was in a community where there was only about 3,000 troops plus the women and children who were there with the soldiers. I never did see him again. Some people said he came from some military post a ways away. Um, we need to understand, we, we need discernment to discern good and evil. And sometimes good can come into your life uh, in all kinds of ways. And you need that, that alarm bell ringing. And when it rings, put your guard up because there's going to be trouble. But don't fear, just put your confidence in the Lord. And he will help you to overcome. You don't have to worry about that. Now, um, my point was not talking about division or anything like that. It isn't that. I'm just talking about how when we're born again, we become spiritually sensitive and alive, and we get a sense of, of, of things that are going that are good and things that are that are bad and and we understand the difference between good and bad and and by the way can I say that develops with us as we grow spiritually we become more and more attuned and more and more uh, uh, sensitive to that now I believe there is such a thing as a gift of discernment as first Corinthians says and when a person has a gift of, uh, of discernment in a church uh, in a congregation the value of them is this that that they are more sensitive and more quickly on their guard than anybody else. And if they come up to you as a person in leadership and say, I'm a little worried about that, pay attention. Because they're kind of like the dog in the front yard that barks when somebody strange comes around. You really want to pay attention. And so they have a real gift and they have an ability. And, and, and God gave them to the church to profit the entire church. And I believe there is such a thing as a gift of discernment. But I believe that all Christians have some discernment and I think we ought to exercise it and develop it as much as we can in our lives and so this uh, prayer and praise and thanksgiving and love and a sense of good and evil that comes to us because we've been born again and it becomes the the natural thing in our life I don't understand why it is necessary to talk to people about having a prayer time in your life it's the most natural thing about being born again. Don't you want to talk to the Father? And, 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 and Thanksgiving? Don't, you know, we, don't, we don't wait until the turkeys get big enough to, 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 you know, for Thanksgiving. Why should the, the blessing that goes to God have to wait on a bird? It shouldn't. And, and praise ought to be a part of our life. There are things when, when the Lord uh, does things for us. And um, I want to tell you about something that happened yesterday. A group of us guys got together, and we were going to go down to the fairgrounds and go to the, uh, uh, what's that called, the gun and knife and whatever kind of show, because some of us were a little low on ammo because the government's been fooling around with ammo, you know. And so we decided, well, we'd go down there, and we'd restock, and, and, and we got in the line of the cars. That took a while. And when I got up to the, to the thing, I said to the guy, okay, there's 10 of us. Uh, and I gave him a credit card, and he said, oh, he said, I don't have the capability of handling a credit card. My little slide thing here has broken on my computer. And I said, okay, what do you want us to do? And he said, just go in, free. That was, uh, what was that, $120? 12 times 10? Yeah. Wow. Praise the Lord. We drove on into the fairgrounds and went there to the building where it was going and, and uh, there was a line coming out of the building and so we looked down the street and the line went down the street and then it turned the corner and it went down a, another way and then came back and then another way and it looked like it was about three blocks long. Oh man. <laughs> After all that waiting in the car line, now I'm going to stand outside here because, you know, our governor thinks that we should only have a certain number of people in a great big old barn at a time. Okay. So we decided, as we watched that line, I said, I don't want to stand outside. It was kind of cool. You know, I don't want to stand outside uh, that long. And I mean, I can get ammo eventually somewhere. And, and everybody said, well, you know, well, there's a place in Anderson that sells ammo. Really? 
what do you think? Let's just drive up to Anderson. So we all were in the van. Yeah, let's go to Anderson. So here we are, just, you know, this, this is fellowship, guys. We're just having fellowship. And so, yes, let's go to Anderson. So we, we had prayer before we got in the van, but we didn't know where we were going, apparently. So we drove up to Anderson. Does anybody know which turnoff it is? Somebody knew the turnoff. Does anybody know what the store looks like? We, we passed it, but then we came back to it, and it turned out to be just a little old hole in the wall. I mean, it was small. What? It was. And, and we got to the door, and it said three people at a time in here. Well, I could understand when you're getting in a closet, you don't need a whole lot of help. And <clears throat> they had a warehouse behind it, but in the little building where we were, it was just like, you know, turn around. I, it didn't take me very long to find the bullets I wanted, so I paid for them and too much and went outside and then the other guys and so we were standing outside and finally all of us got what we were looking for there and we decided well we we got we got the ammo that we wanted well, let's praise the Lord you know we didn't have to wait in line through three blocks of people outside at the fairground just a short line of us ten getting in the front door so praise the Lord for that you know I hear in Anderson there's a couple of nice places to eat there's this chicken joint somebody told me about and I don't know where it is. And I heard about a pizza joint. Brother, Brother Cook tells me that people will drive all the way to Indianapolis to eat their pizzas because it's that good. And I didn't, what was the name of that place, fellas? What? Greek's Pizza. Doesn't sound like an Italian name, does it? Anyway, <coughs> so we go to Greek's Pizza. Nobody's there. The parking lot's empty. The place is all shut up, it's, you know. So we pulled in beside it, and somebody gave him a call. Uh, when do you guys open? We're open now. What do you mean? We're inside. I don't know what they did with their cars. They must have walked there. So we went around the parking lot and went in, and we just had the best pizza that I think I've ever had in Indiana. Yeah. Yeah. I was sitting on the end of the table that got the Greek pizza, which turned out to be really good, and then somebody got the pizza with all the stuff on it that falls off when you try to eat it. That. That, that was the pizza down at that end. But we had a, we had a great time of fellowship there. And, and uh, a, a, an older couple pulled in, and the man came in, and he looked and saw all those men in the back laughing and making noise, and I think we kind of scared him a little bit. And he went back outside, and he stuck his head in the window and talked to his wife for about 10 minutes, and finally they came in. And they got the table right by the front door, far away from us as they could get <laughs> One of our guys paid for them to get a dessert, and another guy paid for their meal. And we laughed, and we had fun, and we had a good prayer time here in the parking lot when we got back. Uh, I, you know, sometimes you need to praise the Lord. You know, his presence is uh, just incalculable. What a blessing it is, how much fun we had. Uh, don't, don't misunderstand me. I love my wife. I love my wife. But every once in a while, I need a time with a group of guys. And so we, we went up, and we had a great time and, and wonderful fellowship and, uh, and blessings all along the way, God helping us all along the way. Um, those kind of things happen to you when you're walking in the Spirit. You're born in the Spirit. You walk in the Spirit. Those kind of things happen to you. But this Scripture says something kind of unusual here. This is the King James because I think it's a little more true to the Greek than the NIV. Whoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. See the expression born of God used twice there? But then there's that second part. We talked about born of God this morning. The second part, it was born of God, does, doth not commit sin. Yes, I know how to read the King James. I grew up with the King James Bible. I figured, you know... Well, I just grew up in a church where everybody had a King James Bible, so I bought one too, you know. <laughs> Didn't know any better, and, and uh, I don't think I know any better now. The, the, the point is, how, how are we going to deal with that second half of that verse? Doth not commit sin. And we talked about being born again is very much like physical birth, and we talked about the examples of that this morning. But no one is, who is born of God who continually receives into their spirit the breath of life from God and the gracious influence of the Holy Spirit. And in return, for that, they have a growing love for God. 
and they understand God's gracious influence of the Holy Spirit in their life, they return love for God and praise and prayer and thanksgiving. Those kind of people who are doing those kind of things do not commit sin. And I think what happens is that we are trying to understand why is it that, that so many people who take a stand for God fall into sin. And, and if we're going to understand our conversation completely, I think we need to define what we're talking about. What's sin? I, I define sin this way. I understand outward sin is what's talking about here in the Word. It's, it's an actual voluntary transgression of the law of God. We understand that. that. That it's the revealed and written Word of God or any commandment of God that's acknowledged to be such at the time as we do it, let me say it that way, if we, if we disobey the clearly revealed will of God for our life, is a shortened way I say that. And if God makes something clear to you through the word, or what, by other ways, you don't do it and you do it anyway, that's sin. Or you must do it and you don't do it, that's sin. That's a sin of omission. So whoever is born of God, while they're... They abide in the faith and the love and the spirit of prayer and thanksgiving. Does not, not only does not, but cannot commit sin. Properly defined. And as long as we believe in God through Jesus Christ, and we love him, and we're pouring out our hearts to him, we cannot voluntarily transgress his commands, because the commands he gives us, we understand are for our best good. And that in the end is going to turn out really great for us if we obey him, no matter how frightful those commands might be on the front end. And so that seed remains in him, that loving, prayerful, thankful, faith-filled kind of spirit remains in him, and it compels him to refrain from doing whatever would be uh, an abomination to God. And so we, we have here a difficulty, and the difficulty is this, and, and it's one that I wanted to get into because this verse brings it up to our mind. We all know people who have fallen, don't we? People who, who really have served the Lord, and, and, we, and it creates a question for us. I think um, I was going to talk to you about Paul tonight, but instead I think I'll talk to you about David. He was a person who was born of God. He knew in whom he believed. David was strong in faith and, and gave glory to God. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. And in Psalm 118, 28, You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. That sounds like exactly what we've been describing about a spiritual person. Yet, such a loving child of God was involved in committing sin, and not just a sin, but, but horrible sin. He, he took a man's wife, and, and after that, to cover it up, he had the man murdered. Yeah, that would do great things for your church, wouldn't it, in the community? 1 John chapter 5, verse 18 says, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. When you read things like keeps himself, you start thinking to yourself, what, what, what's John talking about? If a person does not remain in faith, does not remain in communication with God, doesn't remain in a thanksgiving attitude, doesn't read their scripture, uh, uh, breaks fellowship with other Christians, and decides that they're going to be a Lone Ranger Christian. Even the Lone Ranger had Tonto, you know, and that really nice horse. If that person does not remain in the faith and, and keep himself, he's going to commit sin just like any other person. And how does it happen? Here's how it happens, and if you want to write it down, I'll just give you a quick list. I won't hold you long tonight. The, the blessing of God, the spirit in us, that divine seed that he talks about of loving, conquering faith, remain in the believer. That's what happens. But then a temptation arises, number two. And it can come from three sources. It can come from the world, or it can come from their own flesh. And uh, later on in another sermon, I'll talk about carnality. And it can come directly from the devil, an attack from the devil. And those uh, kinds of temptations, I must tell you, are the most fierce. So a temptation arises. And the Spirit of God gives a warning. 
Look out. You know, that, that sense of discernment is there. Sin's near you. You've got to watch out. You need to spend more time in prayer. Isn't that what Jesus said to Peter? You need to watch and pray so that you don't enter into temptation. A lot of times we bring temptation down on ourselves because we don't watch and we don't pray. Well, I'm, I, I think about prayer. <laughs> good. Not good enough, but it's good. And then we find the person giving away in some degree to the temptation. Maybe not completely, but a little bit. And the Spirit gets grieved by that. And so the Holy Spirit, being the Holy Spirit, uh, has a talk with you. And it's not an enjoyable talk. And he corrects you and says something like uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4, this is the way. Not that way, this way. Turn around and go the other way. Does that work for you when you're trying to correct little children? It doesn't. I think that God has trouble with some adults too. And the person turns away from the sharp correction that the Holy Spirit's giving. And they hear a more pleasing voice, which is coming from where? The devil's side. You know, uh, temptation is always alluring. The devil appears like a, an angel of light and, and uh, you know, has a sweet and gentle voice. Well, you know. Listen, let me, can I give you just a little piece of advice spiritually? When people walk up to you and they begin talking to you, in a breathy, spiritual voice, put your hand on your wallet and hang on. Okay? There. Now we're better, aren't we? Because they use that kind of a voice in drawing people away. Uh, Sometimes it's, it's better to be slapped by a friend than kissed by an enemy. And uh, we don't know that. And so when we get rebuked by the Holy Spirit, we kind of draw away from that, and then the tempter begins to say, and so the evil desire begins spreading in a person's soul until, until faith and love begin to vanish within them. And they start thinking things like, well, you know, I, uh, here I am tempted, and I probably can't help from giving in to temptation. You know, I've heard that there are some churches that teach that you sin every day in word, thought, and deed, and this must be the one. I wish they would just please stop talking. And then suddenly that person is capable of outward sin because he's departed from the Lord and the Lord's departed from him. That's how it happens. Sin follows the loss of faith. Faith goes first, and then sin comes second. Faith that, that God is more than enough, and the blessings of God are more than enough in our life. We lose faith in the direction that God's leading us. We lose faith that, that somehow, if, if I don't grab this opportunity that's in front of us, I'm going to be cheated out of something for the rest of my life. It, 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 it's, a, it's a lack of confidence in God that he really does love you and is seeking you the highest good for the object of his love. Do you understand that he sent Jesus to the cross to save you from your sins? So if he tells you don't do something, that's not, there's not a hateful uh, a reason behind it. God's not some kind of cosmic killjoy. Like a lot of people are, are made to think when they're getting involved in some things. He's not. I, I haven't regretted anything that's happened in my life over the years as a result of following the Lord. <laughs> I've been through some stuff, but, but uh, let me just tell you, uh, it's, it was worth it. And there have been so many blessings that came along with it, I just, I, I hardly can count the problems. Some sins of omission can precede a loss of faith because sometimes people lose their faith after they just stop praying like they should. I, I think there's five points to well-rounded Christian life. I think Christians need to pray. I think Christians need to witness. And so we just stop doing that. And I think Christians need to have devotions. That's a battle. You do understand that. Fight the battle, but don't make it a law. If you make devotions a law, you'll grow to hate devotions. That, that's not the intention of God. Devotions are a necessary, necessary food. If we miss our devotions, what do you do when you miss a meal? 
And the next time opportunity comes, you, you eat. You know, you don't just, oh, I'm a bad person because I missed a meal. Well, some of us could stand to miss a couple, you know. It's not all that dreadful. And, but don't make it a law, but, but, but do make it a part of your life, a well, well-rounded Christian life. We need fellowship. Don't let the devil... I am so sick of the Chinese virus because it is a tool of the devil to break up the church and separate people and to cut us off from fellowship with one another. We're so afraid, you know, so, so concerned. And I don't think that, 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 is, that some of the fears are unfounded. Don't misunderstand me. I've, I've had it, and I'm telling you, you don't want it. Comes time to get my shot, I'm going to get in line and get my shot. March the 22nd, first one. And so uh, I, we, we need to understand that, but, but do you see how it is so broken up fellowships that Christians have, have, have become isolated? And the roaring lion, when he's seeking to devour somebody, looks for somebody who's cut off from the rest of the flock and attacks them. And boy, is, is there a lot of loose game out there for the lion? And then being the brilliant creatures that we are, we see them out there roaming around, so we go out there and smack them because they're roaming around. That was a really brilliant thing to do. Why aren't you in church? Does that work on you? Because <laughs> it's been done to death in West Virginia, and it doesn't work there anymore. <laughs> How about calling them up and saying, you know, I love you and I'm praying for you. Looking forward to the time we get back together and worship. You know, talk to them like a Christian, because, you know, you are one. Some sin of omission can, can precede the loss of faith, and so we, we don't follow the things that we need. Oh, what's the fifth one? Worship. It's the one we're, that we're missing the most. And I don't care what anybody says. I mean, it's okay to watch TV. and, and stuff. You are never going to replace... Uh, live worship service with a TV. I, I mean, it's just not going to, you know, because you miss the genius of the moment. It's the sense of God's presence. And, and sometimes, even when the person is saying kind of foolish things, God can use them anyway and, and bless your heart at that moment. Sometimes not so much over the TV. At the TV, you're not, you're not worshiping. You're, you're an observer. I mean, it scares me for the people who are in the booth out back there. And the guy who sits out there in the hall guarding our life, thank you for doing that, John. But you, you can become a kind of a, an observer, and it, it can cut you off from getting the blessing of worship. It's, it's important. I remember in my home church, we had a whole row of guys used to sit way in the back of the church. They had a bunch of chairs back there in the back of the church. And uh, I even remember some of their names, but I remember those old guys sitting back there in the back of the church together, and they often would talk to each other while the service was going on. I used to refer to that after I became a Christian. I would look back there, and I used to refer to that as Skid Row. <laughs> you don't know what that is? Good for you. Don't ever learn it. But we need to examine our hearts and see that faith is working by love and it excludes the outward sin that we're being tempted to get involved with because we're so busy with God and about God and about the things of God and praising God and glorifying God and thanking God that, that it puts down the temptation when it comes. And we recognize it for what it is. We have thankfulness and obedience and love and service to God, and those are a part of our life. Why? Because the Spirit is in us. And we don't do those things because we have to. We do them because we want to. Those guys were real nice to that uh, man and his wife who we scared to death at that restaurant. They were nice to them to send them uh, dessert and, 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 and pay for their meal, but nobody made them do it. They did it because they were just prompted to do something good. And if we're doing the things that the Holy Spirit is prompting us to do, we don't have time for the things that the Holy Spirit is warning us not to do. Because people who are born of God doth not commit sin. 
Why? Because his seed remaineth in him. And here's the other reason. He cannot sin because, do you see the reason? Because they're born of God. Because they, Wesley always taught us that there's enough grace and salvation to keep a person from, from breaking out into sin and committing outward sin. Isn't there grace of God to help us to overcome the temptations of the evil one? And if not, then why in the world are we having church? Are we wasting our time? Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Did you hear me read that line? He came to destroy the works of the love. What, what works of the In us. And we need to let him do that. And so we need to keep ourselves in the love of God. We need to be careful that we're doing these things and observing these things. And, and it's not a hard struggle to be a Christian. It's really the way of the sinner that's hard. And it just gets worse. Let's stand. We're thankful that we have been justified by faith and by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, but more, that by the Spirit we have been born again, born of you, Father. And all the things that that brings into our life, our eyes are open. We're in the real spirit world. We understand things that we couldn't understand before in the flesh, but now in a, in a mind filled with the Spirit, we understand what the Scripture is saying to us, what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. We understand these things. And we pray to your God, that you would help us to continue to walk in that spirit by which you baptized us into your family. Help us, Lord, to always be thankful, to be prayerful, to be people who are filled with praise and obedience and seeking to do good to others. Lord, teach us how to love one another. And Father, we'll praise you for how you use us and how you work in us in Christ's name. Amen. God's blessing on you. See you Wednesday night.